is Dr. Preuss, and what I want to do in this video is go over the article that you read uh, last week uh, to kind of put everybody on the same base as to what you should have gotten out of the article uh, and kind of the structure as I see it. Now, the Preci, uh, I'm, I'm going to give you at the end of this video a little example of how I would do the Preci, and hopefully you did something similar. Uh, and, and so this is a way we can kind of, I can show you uh, how I would have done it so you can compare what you did. So we're going to look at McKibben and some of the things. I've already highlighted some things for you. And um, we know, of course, that what he wants to do is talk about why the Marxist Party didn't really take hold. And he's got a couple of points here that I want to bring out right at the beginning, right on the first page. He says, um, uh, the, the, both the Europeans and the British Labor Party had socialist Marxist ideology, but the British Labor Party did not become as socialist as the other ones. In fact, they came up with another route, uh, antithetical resolutions as opposed to the European parties to their ideological dilemmas. And uh, we brought out before, I brought out last week in a video, that he goes through these four points here, one, two, uh, three, and four, as to how he's going to structure his argument and what he's looking for. And first one is how far did the structure of the workforce encourage a sense of sameness and collectivity amongst its members? To what extent did the associational culture of the British working class encourage or impede the transmission of a rejectionist ideology? And how far did the class feel itself excluded from civil society? And finally, to what degree did it possess a leadership which could articulate and direct a specifically socialist working class politics. So let's go ahead into the article. And I want to bring out a couple of points, some things that to me, I think are important. Uh, at the bottom here of this second page, uh, he says, in other unions, insofar as the argument had a clear point, it was the socialism of the Labour Party which was objectionable. So is that people didn't like the term socialism. They didn't, they, you know, they might have been for it, but it was the socialism that was objectionable. So there's already a problem with the socialism. Now, this is the next page, 299. Towards the bottom, a couple of points. Uh, the comparative failure of the general union in the unskilled trades implies that any political party would at least have as much difficulty organizing them. So th there were problems organizing people into unions. So that's a big problem. Towards the bottom of the page, at the, at the bottom of the page, look at the essential characteristics, he says, of the Edwardian working class. Now, the Edwardian was the period, the early 1900s. After the Victorian era, you have the Edwardian era. The Edwardian working class. And in them was a collective sense of class which etiolated or paled almost to non-existence. On the contrary, it was a jaunty and attractive individualism which was essential to their lives. So already they're having a hard time organizing because not as many people joined a union, he says. They were very individualistic, working class people. One thing that he brings out here, this is a quote uh, from somebody else, and I think this is interesting, right? He's talking about people being isolated, and there were a lot of people who were shop uh, workers, and in fact... Uh, uh, Hitler at one point makes fun of the English, you know, it's a, it's a nation of shopkeepers. There's a lot of people who worked in service industries, in shops. It says, the average shop worker doesn't read the papers. But how, he was asked, is it that intelligent men cannot combine as well as working men who have less education and less intelligent? Because working men have the opportunity for social intercourse with each other and for discussing these matters which shop assistants have not. So they weren't very 
um, unified is what he's saying. So we're going to go here to uh, the bottom of page 302. And there's another point that he makes here. And, and he talks about this earlier on, and this is what he's talking about, but this is the summation. The patterns of employment were so fragmented and localized. Political communication and group loyalty became multilinear. Men could unite against masters. Equally, they could unite with them. So again, there was no um, unified working class, he keeps saying over and over again, and he, what he, his evidence uh, goes to substantiate this argument that the working class was fragmented. So at the bottom of page 303, the geographical separation of the classes, right, people were scattered, was probably the most important feature of 19th century urban development. Now remember, and from your foundations quiz, there weren't that many urban areas in England. You have London, of course, and some of the areas south of it, but then you have a large area of countryside, and then towards the middle of England, you do have Birmingham, uh, Sheffield, uh, that area around Liverpool, uh, across over to the Sheffield area in Leeds, which was a more urban area, a lot of industry going on there. But people were scattered. And then and one of the other things he says is, what does this do? Well, because of poverty. Poverty, people are working and trying to survive. They don't have time for other distractions. Poverty also implied mobility which implied votelessness. So people moved around because they were looking for jobs, because they were poor. They didn't have any stable roots, and so they weren't eligible to vote. Now, you would think that this would make them more ripe for Marxism. But he says that's not what happened, right? They were rootless. Uh, they were scattered about. They, they didn't stay in jobs very long. But instead, he says, of making them prime suspects for Marxism, they turned a different way, and then he goes into this. The second reason is division of labor, is that men, he says, uh, were much tied to the camaraderie of working with other men. Yeah, they had families, but it was their working uh, associations, their friends, that they looked to for social activities. Now, people may argue with this, and I think... This is one of the weaker points of his arguments. And here we go down to page 305. Uh, tensions within working class communities almost certainly undermined local solidarity. And so there were problems among people, but it didn't allow them to unify. Now, I don't know about that, but that's one of his arguments. The somewhat mon monolithic appearance of the working class presented to strangers Concealed divisions wherein, uh, which were at least as intense within communities as they were within the workforce. So people didn't necessarily always get along with each other. They didn't have this unity that was necessary, he says, for Marxism. And then he makes another important point here at the bottom of this. Ed in the Edwardian period, high mobility, why disfranchisement and irregular employment introduced a chaotic element into the politics of working class neighborhoods. So there's kind of his summation of why uh, this disunity happened. Then he also brings up a little bit further down there on page 306, it was a culture without a unified communitarian interest and incapable of giving ideological directions to a working class consciousness. People were too spread apart, people weren't organized, uh, so they didn't form this unity that was necessary for Marxism. Now he moves on to his second question. The second area he's going to address is the associational life. And one of the things that he points out is that at the bottom of this paragraph here, the established associational culture, this group, the, the idea of people like to join things, one whose organizing energies, political energies in the broadest sense, could be utilized and directed by the party, did not exist in Great Britain. And why is that? Well, people had other organizations. Sports. People were very into sports 
in the late 19th, early 20th century. So were the United States uh, citizens, right? We had baseball and basketball and other sports that were coming of age, uh, football later on. He says, likewise, they had what we would call soccer. They would call it football. But also church organizations. They had hobbies. And they had this memories of a rural past, this nostalgia of, and this is going to play more a role later on, this idea of a rural past had material significance even for a working class increasingly taught to believe the country, uh, that country life, the country people, were alien and almost comic. So, here in 307. He also says that besides this, that they had these connections to uh, the old way of life, that they had uh, this, uh, these organizations they were part of, these clubs, uh, that they also were seeing an increase in their wages. Now, he said that this seems doubtful that this would really stop socialism. But he does say that what happens is that the British wages allowed people to do what they liked. They were they were coming up with a leisure time and that they had a time to go out and enjoy life because of the work that they did. They gave the working classes a certain autonomy, an opportunity to choose between alternative activities not available to other European workforce, this leisure time. And they could decide what they wanted to do on their own. So they had choices that they could make because they had a little bit more money and they were part of these organizations and sports and whatnot. So page 309, working class associations were thus not merely complementary to party political actions. They were competitive with it. So if you were organizing a political party, you had to uh, compete with these other clubs and these other groups that people were already part of. And so why should they join yours, right? They had outlets for their tensions. They had outlets. They had entertainment, things to take their minds away from it. On page 310, he goes on to one of the most powerful constraints, he says, upon any political party, the most salient determinants of its character and success is its formal ideological environment. Okay? And so, what this means, he writes, why this is important, it's an important, if comparatively small, part of the workforce was not so scattered, and, if, and the conditions in which it worked by no means facilitated matingism, chumminess between masters and men, structurally there seems no reason why it should not have attracted more to a rejectionist ideology, right? So people weren't really chums with who they, with they, who they um, worked for, although there was some commonality, right? But he says, in practice, all members of a society inherit assumption attitudes with which they live and which they modify only a part, right? We live in a society. We live in an environment, the past, however it reaches us, shapes our present actions. And as individuals or as groups, we can merely struggle to reformulate our own histories. As Marx admitted, the past weighs like a nightmare on the brain of the living, and it weighed no less heavily on the brain of the British working class. It inherited traditions which both burdened and liberated it, an ambiguous set of social values which it shared with other classes and which gave legitimacy to institutions and sentiments whose ideological power produced a revolutionary rhetoric or strategy. This is an important page. So what he is saying is, they've got these other factors, but let's look at ideology. And he says on page 310 that this is very important and that this idea of culture, this society that the British had was very important in why they did not become Marxist, why the Marxists didn't take a greater root. And let's look on page 311. Here's another, uh, the starred uh, paragraph, another important note. The monarchy provided entertainment and 
uh, kind of a unifying vision or symbol for the country. The crown stood for show. It had pomp. It had circumstance, right? Uh, it, it had this, uh, you know, you would go out and you would see the pageantry of the king at the time. The House of Commons, part of Parliament, that represented everybody, stood for fairness, a promise that rules would be obeyed. The acceptability of both to the working class underwrote the existing status order and preserved the country's institutions and class system more or less intact. Now, here we have an important follow-up to that other important page that I mentioned just a minute or two ago. So people, he says, in Great Britain, look to the king and queen, the monarchy, as symbols that unified them. And that parliament ensured a sense of fairness. Other nations, he says, had monarchs. But it wasn't that sense of parliament that they had. The sense of fairness that other nations didn't have which led them to become more Marxist than the British. So we're going to skip ahead, uh, you know, as you go ahead and you read through here, uh, you know, he substantiates his arguments. On page 313, here's another point. Parliament, parliament which clothed it with a functional one, right? The, if the legitimacy the monarchy gave to the existing social system was quasi-hieratic, parliament clothed it with a functional one. While there was in the early part of the 19th century some talk of alternatives to Parliament, there's little evidence that such alternatives were considered. By the end of the 19th century, by the turn of the 20th century, few doubted that a representative Parliament was the proper focus of the working class aspirations. People could get elected to Parliament. This doctrine of representation of the people, he writes, instead of interests and by elaborately formalizing his process on the base strictness of fairness is what appealed to people. People could get elected to parliament, so they had a stake in the game. They could join in as representatives. So on page 314, this idea of the game as an ideological value and a game they had a stake in, a game they could participate in because they could become elected to parliament. People from the working class. Even though a lot of them weren't voting. Voting and elections gained even more ideological acceptability when, like parliament, they became assimilated to the rules of the game. Elections had always been existing and if contested, recognizably part of the great British sporting tradition. Like in the United States today, people are Democrats, people are Republicans or whatever party, and it becomes, uh, for some, a game. You can root for your team, you can switch sides, and so it becomes uh, a part of something that they can watch, they can spectate in, there are rules, there's fair play, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So let's look here on page 350, and here's why. He talks about these societies, and that a lot of the, these are people who are going to be prime minister. Ramsey McDonald um, uh, is one, and um, there's some others that he mentions here, of people who uh, do become prime ministers or speakers. Uh, these societies, because they were to join in political clubs, these societies not only habituated future working class leaders to parliamentary decorum, so they learned how to debate. They learned how the game was played, and they threw and they threw them in with the politically ambitious from the lower middle class, and sometimes even more. So working class, poor people, the lower classes could become members of parliament, and therefore they had a stake in the system. This wasn't always true in other societies, in other cultures. So here we are on page 316. And this is another thing that, 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 that maybe he's overstating. Nationality 
was simply a causal, uh, a causal assumption, I'm sorry, casual assumption of everyday life, right? This sense of being British. We are British. Now, maybe this is overplayed. I don't know that I agree with this, but there is something to this. Uh, a lot of people are fiercely proud in Great Britain of being British from all classes. And so this is what he talks about here. So on page 317, we can therefore establish a working class which was highly dispersed by occupation, having a fairly low level of communication communitarian solidarity following a number of competing associational activities and highly conditioned by inherited ideologies which emphasized a common citizenship, the fairness of the rules of the game, and of the class neutrality of the major institutions of the state. That the government wasn't on any one class's side. Which probably wasn't true. But at least it appeared that way. And I put a star here because this is probably a good summation of the basis of the argument. In fact, I'm going to come back to this a little bit later on. Um, so he talks here again about um, the combination of pomp and fairness. It was part of an ideological pattern that almost distinguished Britain from most of the continental countries. While their political systems were theatrical enough, they were also plainly, plainly arbitrary and unfair. Other countries, right? It's entirely arguable that the traditions, catchphrases, and ideological fragments that shaped working class politics also helped to shape the politics of all other social classes. It's further arguable that the freedom of the middle class to choose the middle and upper class to choose one political strategy as against another was thereby limited by these historical imperatives, while equally the ability of working class to modify the social and economic relationships they inherited was proportionally enlarged. That's an interesting thought, interesting things. Is that all the different classes could choose, had the ability to choose, had choices. So I want to skip down here to page 320. Civil society thus promoted its own stability by subverting the coercive powers of the employers. Government didn't interfere. If you were fighting, he says here, if your union was fighting the employers, there were two sides, the strikers and their employers. The government didn't get involved. The government remained neutral. Now, that probably wasn't 100% true, but at least it appeared that way. They thought that. And so it didn't seem like they were fighting against government and their employers. It seemed like they were just fighting their employers and government uh, was neutral. And so they didn't have that animus against the government. Again, another interesting point that he brings up. All right, so we're coming to the end of the article, I believe. And he's kind of sums up and goes over what he states. Um, and he looks at this fourth condition. What about the leadership? What about this socialist leadership? And what he says is something you're going to see in Orwell. And Orwell kind of explains this, and maybe he gets this idea from Orwell. He writes, It is certainly the case that there were few in the leadership of the labor movement who stood radically outside of the existing class structure or who felt much alienated from it. In other words, the labor leaders were part of the system. The Edwardian Labor Party was overwhelmingly working class in its social origins. It was one of the few European working class parties where there was almost exact social identity between its leadership and those likely to support it. 
Nothing suggests that middle-class influence was important in its rank and file, and the parliamentary party was wholly working class. And then this is where this is what I was looking for earlier. You have people like Ramsey McDonald, who were workers, and it came from a two Snowden, another prime minister, was a working class person. So they came from lower working class, poor, or at least lower middle class backgrounds. Notoriously, he writes, Britain did not have an intelligentsia, and the educational system was not designed to provide one. These, what they had in other European countries, the socialist parties did, uh, marginal bourgeoisie, journalists, uh, theater rhetoricians, professional orators, were comparatively rare in Britain. So you didn't have that kind of a middle class uh, leadership. The workers were choosing their own. And their leaders were workers who were part of the system because they were familiar with parliamentary rules. They were familiar with how government worked. Now, not only was no middle class involved, he writes, a specifically socialist leadership was suspect not so much because it was socialist, but because it was middle class. Workers liked to follow other workers. That they were not middle class was one of their more desirable features. So it's easy to see why so many working class leaders, having freed themselves from direct middle class tutelage, were reluctant to accept it again in the guise of socialism. So, it says here on page 327, the character of the British Labour Party was determined by the structure of the workforce and the ideologies which it inherited. Neither of these favored the development of a Marxist party. This is kind of a summation. And I would say that uh, if you wanted a elevator speech of what this argument was about, this is it. This is the elevator thesis statement. Now, there's a better one, a more detailed one. I'll get back to that later on. Um, He also says that the Labor Party itself had a lot of disunity. Uh, they didn't always agree on everything. Um, so that also prevented the Labor Party from being, uh, from leading to a Marxist cause. Page 330. There was thus no overwhelming grievance no problem in society which could have united the working class against civil society. So they were not rejectionist. This is why the Marxism didn't hold. It says here at the bottom of this page, on page 332 of the prime assumptions of any Marxist party, is a rejection by much of the working class of existing social institutions and a belief in the unity of economics and politics. And that was not the case in Great Britain. The Labour Party, therefore, was not free to choose between Marxism and reformism, but only between varieties of reformism. They were just inherently, according to him, because of these various, um, various factors, they could not choose Marxism. So, I said, you know, if you were looking for a thesis statement, kind of the short thesis statement is here. The character of the Labour Party was tied to the ideology which it inherited from the people, the society, didn't favor Marxism. But I think the better, the more um, elaborate, if you will, um, reason, thesis statement, would be this one here. On page... 
this kind of sums up everything that he's talking about in addition. And then he goes on to a couple of other things. But this is the basis for his argument. So if I'm going to write my praise, let's look at what I'm going to need to do just to kind of give you an outline of, of where we're going to go. It doesn't have to be very long. Remember, it's actually a short assignment as far as what you're going to be turning in. The real uh, the real length, the real work lies in reading the article and understanding the argument structure. So if we're putting together the praise itself, I'm going to need my name, date, um, and then the class, History 3309. These should all be single-spaced on the left. So I'm going to make sure that these are uh, on the left, and I'm going to uh, go to the paragraph here to make sure that I've got uh, spacing at single spacing with no additional points between. Okay, so I'm happy with that. Uh, then I'm going to need to put in the bibliographic entry and so this is why I have the article information right here in front of me. So this is a bibliographic entry. So the last name goes first. McKibben, Ross, period. The title of his article is Why Was There No Marxism in Great Britain? Okay. Then this is in the English Historical Review, volume 99, number 391, which is April of 1984. And we use a colon for the page numbers, uh, 297 through 331. Now I'm going to format that here in just a bit. I might also want to put the URL. That's not necessarily required, um, but we could put that in there uh, later on. So there's the URL if you want to put that in there. Okay, you can type that in. So I just want to show you how to do... Uh, this real quick, the quick and dirty method. First of all, this is a hanging indent. On a bibliography, it's formatted a little bit differently. It's, it's called a hanging. So what we're going to do is we're going to highlight that, click it, go to paragraph, and it's done automatically right here. Hanging, and what that means is this first part sticks out. Now, articles go, the title of articles go in quotation marks. The title of the journals are italicized. So we're going to italicize that. Just click the I uh, here, or I control I is what I did. Now, I'm going to go to the Chicago Manual of Style quick guide here. And then I'm going to go to the notes and bibliography style. So this tells me, this is an article, right? So this gives me some examples. So let's look and see what we want uh, an article to look like. So here's journal article. These are the notes, right? They have the numbers in front of them. It's not what I want. I want the bibliographic entry. And so if we look up here, the note uh, in a bibliography, in the bibliography, include the page range for the whole article. Okay, that's one thing. So what we want to do here is there's the author's last name in reverse order, and there's a couple of them. So let's look at this one here. Author's last name in reverse order, period. The title, the journal that it's in, 38. I don't need volume numbers, so let's get rid of that. So we can just put 99. Okay, number one. I have that here. They don't capitalize there as I did. doesn't really matter. Number one, and then the date in parentheses. And then the page range, followed by a colon, and then the page range. Okay, and they got theirs from Project Muse. Uh, I could say uh, on ours, that's what it's going to look like. I could say on ours that it came from JSTOR. 
if I wanted to. Or however you spell it, JSTOR. I'm not sure which. Um, but there, yeah, there it is. So that's what you would do. Uh, even though this comes from Oxford Journals, we say JSTOR. So you could put the URL or you, or you don't have to. Uh, anybody can look that up. These are fairly easy to look up. <clears throat> that's all you need for the title and for the heading. So then I'm going to bring this up a little bit here so we can see it more clearly. <clears throat> I told you that there were a couple of quotation marks that I really liked. And I starred them. So I put them down here. Uh, McKibben writes, the British working class, quote, was highly dispersed by occupation having, and then he has a little parenthetical here, I cut that out. And so to let the reader know I cut it out, I put these ellipses, these three dots, with a space between each. That just means something's not there. And then I finish out the rest of the quotation. And then only in the precy do you do... I'm, I only have one source, right? I'm just talking about this one book. And so I can do a parenthetical reference here. I don't need a footnote. I can just do in parentheses page number. I don't even need the P period. I don't need that. But I do it here just to make it clear. Page 317. And then there's the other quote that I liked. The character of the Labor Party was determined by the structure of the workforce and the ideally, ideologies which it inherited. Neither of these favored, and I'm using his spelling, not, uh, see, this is a saying, oh, this is spelled wrong. Well, this is a British spelling. So I'm using the British spelling. The development of a Marxist party, quote, page 327. I'm going to say that this is his main quote. So uh, I'm going to say McKibben's thesis. I want to identify this right off the bat is that Marxism didn't take hold in Great in, in England or Great Britain, whatever, um, because the character of the Labour Party was determined by the structure of the workforce, and neither of these favor the development of the of the Marxist Party. Okay, he asks three questions, or he asks he he focuses on four questions. And I can put these either way I want. Uh, I don't like to put bullet points. Uh, you can put this into a narrative. But these are the four questions we identified. And then somewhere along the line, uh, I'm going to say, uh, so if I'm not going to, I don't like bullet points, so we're going to get rid of bullet points. Four questions. Um, you can still do a colon, but uh, you can do a period. And the, I'm not quoting these, so I'm going to have to change the, the uh, spelling. I've got capitalizations here. Uh, I'll have to rewrite this a little bit, but then I'm going to conclude with, um, with this, right? McKibben explains that the British working class was highly dispersed. So this is, this answers most of these questions. And I might want to say something about this one that, uh, they didn't and that they, um, I might do something like that, right, to uh, to round out those four questions that that he addresses. And so this is kind of a, a rough draft of what my precy might look like. 
Yours should be somewhere along the same lines. It doesn't have to be a, a, a exact. There are no, uh, there is no right answer, right? But this is a general outline of what you should have. This is a, a general guideline of what your paper, your precy, might look like. Okay, and so I hope this helps. And again, this is going to get easier each time you do it throughout the remainder of this short summer session. So uh, I just wanted to give you some background so you would kind of know what I'm looking for and, and how this should translate. Uh, and so each time you do it, you're going to get better at doing it and it's going to get easier. All right. Have a great day.